very afraid that I cut in on someone's time, so I, <laughs> I hurried a little. <laughs> so. huh? oh. I can show, start over from the slides. Give me the USB stick. I'll put it on there. The stick is. Uh, oh, this. Oh, it's not stick here. This is a remote. Yeah. Um, okay. You have to connect the AMP with your. Yeah, I can also put mine in. That's okay. Then I can also show maybe some live demos.
to make the computer is not going to make any sounds, right? You are recording the on the other computer with a program. can connect it if you want to, but yes. Let me just first check my presentation see what's going on. Okay, hello and welcome to the second session of this session. And uh, our speaker is going to be Kees van Bochop, who is from The Hive at the Netherlands. And I will let him introduce himself and the work he does. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. Thanks for coming. And. Um, Welcome to this presentation about Fairspace, one of the newer open source tools that we are working with at The Hive. I would like to start with a few introductions. Uh, so what is The Hive? Also tell you a little bit more about Fair Data, at least the way I see it. Don't worry, I'm not going to present you the Fair Principles. I'm assuming a few of you know already them, uh, but reference them. And then the main part is actually to present to you the software that we've been creating and uh, still are working on. I may even have time for some live demos if, uh, uh, if you're interested. And also, I know this is a very big room, but um, 
I do not mind any active interactivity at all. So if you have a question, just raise your hand or, or go to the mic. I'm happy to also be interrupted and explain more. All right, with that out of the way, um, let me first introduce you what The Hive is. It's a company. I started it uh, about seven years ago now. We advance biology and medical sciences, as most of the people are doing here at the conference. But we do it in a particular way, namely by building and serving thriving open source communities. So we have a couple open source communities that we sort of latch onto and really uh, are very active in, contribute to the open source software, etc. I'll give you a few examples in a moment. But first, just to give you a flavor of um, what are we doing on a day-to-day -day basis, we're typically executing projects either for um, pharmaceutical companies, life sciences companies, or for academic hospitals, I will, as I will show you today with Institut Curie. Uh, and increasingly also work with nonprofits like uh, research foundations. And typically the project has to do with one of the open source tools that we work with. And I'm just gonna show you them now. We have divided the company into four groups. So there is a group that specializes in building health data networks. If you've seen presentations here from um, consortia like uh, Genomics England or the Swiss Personalized Health Network or the German Medical Informatics Initiative or the US All of Us Research Project, Precision Medicine Project, these kind of projects require uh, health data networks. So this is one focus area of the company. And we use a, a number of tools to, uh, to set those up. The second is a, a group that deals with real world data, as we call it. So this is a, more of a, a pharma term, I guess, but it references um, existing healthcare data sets, which are typically modeled in OMOP. And we also have a platform for uh, running studies with wearable devices called Radar. Then the third group focuses, um, we call it genomics in the broad term. So one is a key product to see Bioportal for oncology. If you are working in cancer research, you may know this tool, C Bioportal. It's been cited over 4,000 times in the literature. Almost every sort of cancer researcher that is in the translational space uses C Bioportal, uh, either the public version or an internal version that uh, we set up for them. That's one of our business uh, activities. And the other one is Open Targets, which was in initially created by EBI and GSK, as is now also an open source tool that we serve and help, for example, pharma companies to install that. Then the last group that we have is the one that's most relevant to my presentation today, because that group is all about research data management and implementing FAIR in practice. It's also the group that has FAIR space. Okay, um, any questions so far? Shall I ask the question you are afraid to ask? Unless you were not paying attention, then probably you don't have any, but uh, I mean, I can pretty much predict this because everywhere when I present the Hive, I always get the same question. So how do you guys make money? Well, um, I guess it's not uh, difficult to answer that. It's just, this is a concept that is not very well known, uh, professional services for open source software. So in essence, yes, all our software that we uh, produce at the Hive is open source. You can find it on GitHub. Most of it is at github.com slash the Hive. There's hundreds of repositories there that we contribute to. And yes, anyone that wants uh, that to do that can take it and run with it, install it, improve it, you know, modify it. Uh, open source licenses allow you to do that. However, that doesn't mean that there is no market for people that are interested and organizations that are interested in uh, having experts come in to help them use that open source software or get their data into it or install it. So that is how we make money. All right, so second topic, fair data. Um, how many of you are familiar with the fair data principles? Can I see a show of hands? And how many of you can recite all the five, 15 of them by heart? 
Philip can do it. I knew you could. Um, so there is a couple perspective now, nowadays, when we talk about FAIR. First one is um, kind of the societal perspective where it came from. And it has two angles. Uh, there is a part open science to it. And there's also, um, yeah, how, how do I call it? Science 2.0, new ways of doing science with data. And uh, this meeting was, I think, key uh, to in, in order to lead up really to the FAIR principles presentation. Because that has, as you can see, the title, Jointly Designing a Data Fair Port, and um, to also a few consecutive workshops, this is how the FAIR principles were created and finally published in uh, Nature in 2016. And uh, I said I'm not going to go through all 15 of them today, but I did feel sort of obliged to put them on a the slide just in case you haven't read this paper. So you can find the URL here at the bottom. I would highly recommend to look into it. And um, a few people didn't put their hands on, so let me give you like a one minute summary. The idea here is that when working with science, data is very important and data sets are very important. So if I want to reuse data from other scientists, for example, data from public databases or from my colleagues, there's a few things that would be very, very useful if those were um, uh, realized in the data sets that I'm using. The first one is that the data set is findable for me. They actually know that it exists, but also can uh, unambiguously reference it. That's where the persistent identifier comes in and also having metadata, which describes what your data set is about. The F4 is about a grade that you have an identifier and that you have metadata, but now you also need to register it in some source where people think to look. And this is already a hard one, right? So you can, you can apply this in the context of research and open sci uh, science in general. So that's where databases come in and um, repositories. So fairsharing.org is actually a website which is a repository of the repositories. So that's where I would go if you want to know, okay, what repositories are out there. Then there's the accessibility principles. This is about great that I can <laughs> know that the data set exists. Now how can I get to it? How can I actually get the data on my computer, on my server, on my clouds, whatever uh, infrastructure you have? For that, it's useful if the data set uh, has a standardized protocol for accessing it, could be just HTTPS, um, that that protocol is free so that I don't have to buy software to install it, and um, that I can also authenticate myself. So it might be that the data is not open, maybe because there is patient identifiers in there, but then it's still very useful if the mechanism to get to the data is well described so that I know to apply for it and, and uh, get access. The final principle here is that Metadata should be accessible even if the data set itself gets deleted, which will uh, inevitably happen. I mean, try downloading a website from 15 years ago. Uh, chances are it doesn't exist anymore. Maybe it's an archive.org if you are lucky. But, um, but we, what we want to know is, okay, but what was that data? Who made it? Uh, and that may give us, me a proxy to maybe rerun the experiment or you know, go find the authors or something like that. The third principle is interoperability. This is a very interesting one I could spend a whole presentation on, which I'm not going to do today. Uh, I'm especially interested, a hobby of mine is to look at uh, vocabularies for biomedical data, like FHIR and, and OMOP and I2B2 and CDISC and all these things and how they relate. Um, then the reusability principle is the end goal. So sometimes they say you can read the word FAIR as an arrow that points towards the R of reusable. The whole goal we have with FAIR is to make data reusable. If you want to know more about it and read more on the backgrounds, I can recommend this book by Barents Mons and with input from colleagues like Rob Hoft. is a great book uh, if you really want to get all the backgrounds, uh, especially from the open science angle. Also talks about publishers. You can see here the, uh, the nice cartoon which uh, demonstrates how hard it is to get to scientific data today and why we need to change that. 
um, the economic aspect of open science also comes in because we have uh, the European Commission that is very bought into the idea of FAIR and they have this project called the European Open Science Cloud. And as part of that, they also uh, hired some consultants to look at what are the costs of not having FAIR data. And so you can read that report and it gives you a reference of what are the economic costs of us not adopting that. All right, that is the um, open science angle. And now I want to spend just a minute on how that translates into um, concrete activities before I actually go on to my main topic, which is fair space. So the GoFair Foundation and the GoFair Initiative have three different pillars. One is Go Change. So we're talking about open science and publishing. An important aspect is the cultural aspects. Do people actually share their data, right? And the second one is training. So we need to make people aware that, for example, those repositories exist and that uh, a vocabulary exists to code your data rather than coming up with your own classification because that will help others to reuse your data and combine it with others that use the same standards. Finally, there's also a go-build aspect to this. And this is where fair space comes in. We need to build tools that help people make their data fair. So get identifiers, make it accessible, get proper metadata, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, that's the open science sort of societal perspective. There's also a organizational perspective to FAIR. And this is about leveraging the, um, the data in the organization to enable digital transformation. So if you read this book, this is one of the nice books which talks about success of Silicon Valley companies and what is some of the drivers behind it. And, um, AI or machine learning is one of them, or using data smartly is maybe a better word to put it. So uh, FAIR is very, very relevant for, for example, a big pharmaceutical organization. We are supporting multiple of them now in um, making data FAIR across the enterprise. And only if you have your data correctly organized, you can stay competitive in this world. If not, you're gonna be disrupted by a company that actually has all the data correctly organized. And I'm not just saying that because here's a quote from the CEO of Novartis, who's essentially saying the same thing. Um, yes, machine learning, it's important, but he says, I quote, I think people underestimate how little clean data there is out there and how hard it is to clean and link the data. This comes, by the way, from um, a podcast called um, Outside Voices, which I can definitely recommend. Uh, so Vas talks about the whole um, challenges that, that Novartis has these days. And as you may know, one of the biggest pharma companies out there, certainly a number of people that it serves around the world with um, medicines. We also um, uh, have a group, a working group. You may have seen the, um, or not, the uh, announcement from Pistoia Alliance that we're building a fair toolkit. Uh, actually, uh, this started last year when we started a FAIR implementation working group in Pistoia, and we had a nice meeting. Um, this is actually at the Hive offices in Utrecht, where a lot of the people were um, together, and we produced, as a result of this workshop, a paper, which, uh, again, is referenced here. So this talks about if you want to implement FAIR in a pharmaceutical or life sciences organization, what are some of the challenges you will face, and how can you go about this? All right, that's it for the sort of high-level introduction. Now I would like to take you through uh, what we've built together with um, our first customer for this, but we now already have a few more for Fairspace. Let me first explain the situation to you. Why uh, did they approach us to, to build this? Here is a very abstracted way of information in an academic hospital, right? You have... Um, the defining feature of an academic hospital is that you have a hospital, which you see here on the top, but then in addition to that, you also have research groups that are connected to the hospital. And often the situation is such that the um, research teams produce their own data, which may or may not use samples that come from the hospital. And then um, 
researcher that's doing translational medicine has to sort of combine clinical information that's coming from the hospital information system with experimental data that's found on these samples. Uh, for example, uh, looking when you're, when you're doing cancer and you're a cancer researcher, you want to do additional assessment of the pathology and uh, maybe you want to do whole genome sequencing or you want to do an RNA-seq experiment or um, a fish assay or any of those things. And here, the critical thing is how do you keep track of everything that's being done in the hospital so that you can build on the work of others. The Institute has about 80 research groups. So a very key question is, this patient, we can see in hospital information system what the clinical data is and what the clinical images is, like MRIs or CT scans, but they have no idea whether uh, samples from these patients were also used for further research or maybe submitted to a pre-competitive um, collaboration, uh, like uh, Horizon 2020 projects. So it's important to first of all know what data is there and then also to link it together, the clinical and the research data. Fairspace does it in, in mainly two ways. So one is a governance layer where we uh, specify who has access to what. And the second one is a semantic layer which helps to define the metadata around the data sets that are available. So from a functional perspective, Fairspace has a couple of features, and I'm going to show you the screenshot, maybe even the demo, if I can get the internet to, uh, to work. Um, there is a part which serves as a catalog, so now I can see what data is there. Uh, and that has then also a metadata layer, which puts the data stewards in control of how the metadata looks like. So we have sort of two user audiences here when it comes to metadata. One is a um, data overview, what we call a data catalog, and the other one is an interface to design data models. The other thing it does is it can integrate with many systems. So uh, when we created Fairspace, we didn't want it to be a system that everyone has to use, because I don't believe in those anymore. Uh, rather, it's just one flexible layer of metadata around a possibly complex situation that you already have in terms of information tools. So before I go and show the tool, let me first um, spend some time on this slide because it's quite important to understand what I mean by metadata model. Our goal is to make data which sits on drives, S3 buckets on Amazon Web Services, um, uh, USB sticks that people have, uh, computers that are sitting underneath the desk, uh, easy loan file systems, anywhere, right? So you have lots of different sort of file systems here on the right. And then you also have applications, which uh, sometimes uh, often have their own databases and also uh, form a sort of portal into the data. And they often generate outcomes, which we want to capture with metadata. So these are the systems that we want to describe. But in order for data to be findable, accessible, etc., uh, one important piece is metadata. And what Fairspace allows you to do is both define a metadata model, which you see on the left, and the metadata itself. So let me start with the metadata model. This is a very simple example, simplified version of what we have in Institute degree. People have questions like, where can I find the data for this research project? Where can I find other data that is related to this sample? Can you give me all the data set that relates to this patient? Can you give me all the RNA-seq samples that we have which relate to melanoma? Questions like that. And in order to answer these questions, you need um, a number of entities that describe your metadata, your data in a structured way. In this example, I have research topics, which are linked to projects, and a data set can be part of a project. Then we have collections. So a collection is basically a collection of files, and the files can be produced by workflows, um, 
it's going to have a certain data model. Then uh, projects also have patients which have certain consents and uh, these patients have samples taken from them. As I said, this is a simplified view, but my point here is that you make a, some sort of a semantic model which represents the situation in your organization and then what Fairspace allows you to, to actually instantiate this model with concrete instances. So here um, in RDF we call these individuals. So I have a project which is a of the class project and if I make this project then uh, Fairspace knows in this case but any RDF tool that's going to the underlying triple store knows that now I can expect possibly uh, a link to subjects because the subject here is, is actually of a class patient and that's what I had defined in my model. So um, this is how you, you create concrete data. Um, can argue whether you should call this metadata or not, but um, concrete projects, uh, samples, consent forms, etc. And then the last step is that we link this to the files and collection that, as I said, could be all over the place. And by doing this, now I have a way to ask the questions I was referring to a minute ago. Is this clear or do you have questions about this? Because it's quite an important concept. The metadata model, then the metadata itself, and the files. The whole point of Fairspace is that we want to build a tool where data stewards can design this model themselves. Even data stewards who are not RDF experts. And I'm gonna show you how that works. But, uh, and this is also why we created this tool and we're making it open source, because to my knowledge, something like that doesn't even really exist in the semantic web world. And if you do know a tool like that, please let me know, because we have done like an extensive sort of look around, um, and we'd be happy to reuse anything that's out there. So, uh, right, let me give you an example of this work. So, under the hood, we use Shackle, which is a shapes constrained language for RDF. And in Shackle, I can uh, specify um, constraints, but I'm not going there yet. It starts with, I'm actually defining a shape, and this is a class shape. This is a class shape that defines what a research project should look like. Here on the left, you see that a research project has a class, which has this uh, URI. So I have vocabulary slash research project. It has a name and a description. And then it can have one of more properties. These are actually RDF properties. So I'm using here RDFS comments, which is a very basic RDF property. Then I have label. Um, I also use uh, WST, so these delineators before the, the colon is a, um, what we call a namespace in RDF. So uh, WST just stands for my uh, workspace namespace. So this is, workspace is a part, uh, part of Fairspace. Uh, I have collections in the workspace, I can have consents, I have defined investigation nature, project code, and project manager. Now using this shape, the Fairspace uh, user interface automatically creates a form if I want to make a specific instance of this research project. So you can see that the, um, the, in the, the GUI here is one-on-one -on -one linked to the description. So um, it, it figures out because this is a RDF property which is a string that it should display a string widget here uh, that it's here I can actually enter collections that it can find in the database. Here I can find investigations, the, the natures, which is a list in the database, label, person consent, etc. So as I said, under the hood, here is the RDF, which it produces. So you have here the uh, class shape and it tells me the description, name, target class, tells me something about the ignores properties, and then it is all these links. The cool thing is that Fairspace automatically produces this code. Yeah, sure.
Yeah, yeah, that's a very good uh, question. So I went from high level to very deep RDF stuff really fast here. Um, if you think about this go change um, categories that I mentioned uh, a couple minutes ago, to make FAIR happen, we need a number of different things. And one of those is we need, to, we need data stewards. It's a term that's introduced, um, I don't know if it really came from a FAIR community, but it's at least very close to it. So what is a data steward? A data steward is someone that helps people that are working with data researchers to make sure that their data is fair. So a data steward is an expert in things like ontologies, um, what, what is proper metadata, and it, those persons can also help within an organization, for example, to point people to the right systems. Like, hey, you have an RNA data, uh, RNA seq data set here. Do you know that there is a repository of RNA data seq where you can both publish your research, but you can also go there to find other interesting sets? So a data steward is like um, a spin in the web for helping researchers with data. Now, there are a lot of good and sound technical ideas in the semantic web RDF community, which are extremely powerful and which can help you realize all this. But if we have to train every data steward in RDF and become an expert in semantics, I think that will be a bottleneck. So what we're trying to do here with this tool, and, and we may completely fail with this, and I'm also happy with sort of the interaction here. Um, what we're trying to do here is make a tool that helps new data stewards who are not necessarily RDF experts to still be able to use the power of RDF and semantic web. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but... <laughs> so the, um, maybe I should show you the interface which would come next. Um, right. Th this may help because it's a little bit more concrete. So a data steward has to think about what are the right ways to put metadata around the data that we have. So here you can, this is again a very simple example, but um, a data steward would be someone that thinks about, well, what kind of investigation or project types do we have in our organization? Maybe something like basic research, uh, biomedical research, clinical trials, and um, medical diagnosis types of projects. What we're doing with Fairspace is we're providing the data stewards with a means to define these kind of lists without having to learn RDF and the whole semantic step below it. So if I make this, it's actually um, converted into a shackle uh, constraint here, property shape. The same goes here. Um, so, so I have the, the this is a different type of property. So here I had a class shape. Now I have a data type property. So a certain data type, I can specify further constraints on how it should look like. So here I'm saying that um, I want a project manager to be a string, but I only want a maximum, I wanna put a maximum length there. So again, that's then converted to uh, shekel. In Institute Curie, this is um, a summary of the data model that we're now using to provide information about the data in Curie. So we have here the, um, the files that are on drives everywhere. These are part of collections. And these collections themselves are again part of research projects. So this gives us the basic context of, okay, I have a file somewhere or a database now I know where it belongs to in the organization. Uh, so this kind of, the fundamental decision here is that we use research project as a divider, if you will. What we also have in, is analysis of um, files. And um, we have a tumor pathology event here. So this event could be analyzed and the, the result of the analysis could be present in a file. 
that pathology event, of course, is related to a patient. So that's why we have event subject here and a person. And that person may or may not have given a consent to use this data and uh, samples for research, which is here. Finally, uh, there is also a sample aspect to this. So the files here are also directly linked to samples. And using this model, I have multiple ways of providing some metadata. I may not always know which research project it belongs to, but I may know the patient or I may know the sample. So I can fill one or more of these. Yeah. Okay, so um, I hope that's clear. Let me also give you a overview of the catalog function that we have. So if you open Fairspace, what you see is these collections. Um, so Fairspace is divided in workspaces and when I enter a workspace, I have collections here which represent data. And this data, to be clear, is not necessarily stored in Fairspace. It can be anywhere, we just link it. So in the, in the example of uh, Institute Curie, they have a very big Isolon file system, so we link the file system to Fairspace. That allows us to browse. Another thing we can do is link it with iRODS. So iRODS is software which allows you to virtualize many different file system uh, storage elements so we can connect to iRODS so that you can browse your iRODS data in Fairspace and put metadata on top of it. Uh, I think in this case, yeah, I would have to ask the developers, but one thing I heard, it might, I may be wrong on this, is that they're using a WebDAV client from, uh, from uh, Isilon and have another component in Fairspace that basically translate that to the semantic model that you're seeing here. So as I said, uh, metadata, you can define it on a collection level, and you can also define it on a file level. So uh, I have here um, a browser, which is, looks a bit, a bit like Dropbox or Google Drive. I don't think that's the interesting part of it. But if I were using iRODS, I could actually, um, even in Fairspace, uh, delete or remove or rename files, and that would be carried out in, uh, behind the scenes in iRODS. Then um, users, they do not have permission to change the metadata model, but what they of course can do is make new instantiation of the model. Like they can make a new sample or they make a, make a new analysis or register a new patient or register a new research project. We allow to do this in the uh, user interface of Fairspace. In practice, with the customers that we're working with is actually often a bot that uh, injects this. So, I mean, no one, no one researcher is gonna type in all the patient IDs in the hospital, right? So often this is a, a bot or another function is an Excel upload. Then um, we also have a form for filling, filling in. So if I choose here, uh, let's say I want to register a new person, then, um, actually no, sorry, a new sample, biological sample. What it will do, it will generate a form and I can fill in all the properties that are available for a sample. So a sample can have parent samples, it can have, in this case, a tumor cellularity property, which apparently the data steward uh, of, of this uh, workspace thought was important to put there. All right, so we went through a lot of sort of complex topics there. Um, I told you that each workspace has a configurable metadata model. Remember the slide with the three layers, the metadata model and then the actual metadata and the files. So each workspace has a metadata model. Data stewards can maintain this model via Shekel and we help them to do that via GUI which also makes sure that you're generating, let's say, proper shackle and that it's linked. Um, the idea is that the data stewards use this functionality to configure for ongoing research. Once you define the model, it generates forms that can help with entering information manually. 
quickly, like research projects or samples or consents, etc. And finally, the model is programmatically actionable. So um, we have a bunch of APIs. You can also use direct Sparkle uh, to go to the RDF store behind this. The interface that is presented to the data stewards has a different way of defining, because uh, here I'm defining actually the, the second layer, the metadata itself. The data stewards, however, can define the model. And if you're defining model elements, you already saw this in my examples, you actually have a few way, uh, types to choose from. So there's the class shape, which would be a research project. There's controlled vocabularies, which is just a list of things, basically. You can have um, data types, and there, then there's even namespaces and relations. So yes, you need to have some training and some course in semantics in order to do this. I'm not saying that every data steward can just use Fairspace and define a model, but um, what, I, what we are hoping to accomplish with this tool is that that training will be a lot shorter than actually if you have to learn the four RDF and Shackle and OWL and all these things I would relate to. And what's also useful is kind of the tool set for data stewards that we're building up here. So you can search for entities. Uh, we're working on visualizations, like there's some open source tools that visualize models like WebVowel for OWL. Um, so these are things that we bring in just to enable the data stewards to to build out these vocabularies quickly. Um, and, and yeah, maybe it's good to also, just so that you can relate to the tool, um, these apps here or functions of the tool uh, denote the various capabilities. So the collections is, I'm looking at files. The metadata is the actual metadata, so the second box in that overview slide I showed, and the vocabulary, that is the actual model. So here I'm in the vocabulary editor, so I'm editing the model. And here I'm in the metadata, so here I'm looking at an actual instantiation of a model resource, in this case, a research project. There are a number of other things that we want to do because in the beginning I mentioned there's not only files, but there's also applications. So how could you possibly integrate with applications? What would be really cool is if someone is writing an application that they have a way to automatically make all the data fair that is generated by that app. I think again, here we're talking about concepts here that uh, need to be shaped over the coming years and we're in the very first stages of this. But one of the things that we've integrated, I guess just as a proof of concept is Jupyter. So Jupyter is a open source scientific notebook application. And um, what we've done is integration with Jupyter in such a way that if you're in Jupyter Lab, you again see the same files uh, that are uh, in turn uh, accessible to Fairspace via iRolls or S3 or file systems or any, any way that's connected. And then um, I have now in Jupyter an API where I can talk to Fairspace and register basic metadata. For example, if I create a new file, I can easily then tag it with new metadata that tells Fairspace and the metadata model what this file is about. And that way we can actually make data fair while the researcher is working, instead of at the end of the cycle when you publish something to Dataverse or you know, some fair repository. Again, as I said, this is early days. I'm not even sure this will really work out, but it's worth a try because what we want to accomplish here is to make FAIR as seamless as possible, that as a researcher you can just go about your job and the things are kind of becoming FAIR by default. Yeah, so um, I, I guess that's the most important functions of the tools uh, that I wanted to show you. I'm sure there are some questions and discussion points. And if not, um, I can also attempt a, kind of a live demo and maybe show you more examples of how this would work. Yeah, questions? Yeah. 
Okay, so let me take the second question first. Um, here on the screen, when I have these screenshots, I am in one workspace. So the way we work in EC3 is that you have several workspaces and these map actually to the research group. Like right now, um, we're working with the melanoma research group, so um, helping them with defining a model that makes sense for melanoma. And then they also the collections that they have relate to that research group. However, um, of course, it's also important to have an institutional repository of all the data sets that are available. And often you will find that at least in modern European academic medical centers already have one. Uh, like in Netherlands, we have seven UMCs, and most of them are using Dataverse internally. So rather than making another repo and kind of another silo, um, what we enable uh, the data stewards to do is to publish a part of this metadata to the institutional repository. So that there is where um, all the workspaces come together. This also allows another thing because um, often researchers don't want to share everything with the whole world yet. Uh, not because they are, you know, have a bad mind or something, but just because if you're working on something, you don't, you want to only show it to other people and share it once it has a form where it makes sense to share, right? Uh, you're also not sharing your notebook where you scribble things for the whole world. There's no point to it. So um, in this case, the workspace, uh, and also the collections in there, by the way, because they're on ACL, so you can make a private collection and then later share it with others, gives you a way to granularly uh, open up to the organization, and at some point you can decide, okay, now we want to publish to this, this institutional repository. I hope that answers your second question, and now I have to go to the first. Okay. There's one. Yeah, I was just wondering, what's your experience when you when you actually roll the system out across such a large organization? I mean, it would need to be required as much as it's a cultural shift, very much in terms of how people register their data, right? right? And it, it, the, the system hinges on that everyone, all the data is actually in the system, right? If, if, if it's something that's voluntary, then only 50% are in the question. Um, as I said, we're also helping multiple pharma companies to sort of make a fair data strategy in, in, in several aspects. And what I perceive, I actually had a discussion um, one day about this with someone who's quite high up in an academic research hospital. Um, it, it may even be easier in a pharma company than in a hospital. Because in a UMC, the um, Now, I know it, uh, in a pharma organization, it's not easy either. Uh, hundreds of systems, legacy systems, data all over the place. No one knows how the organization really works. You have to talk to people. It's not easy either, but at least the CEO can say, okay, guys, we're gonna do a digital transformation strategy. I'm gonna create a new uh, data office. I'm gonna staff it, and I'm gonna hire people, and I'm gonna force the researchers to actually work with them to make this happen. It's not a pretty picture, but from an organizational perspective, you need to, because otherwise you're gonna be left behind by companies that are better at this, right? So, um, and this tool, Fairspace, by the way, is sort of tangential to that. So we are doing a lot of Fairspace consult uh, fair consulting, and then Fairspace is one of the tools that we developed that we, we think can bring this also to other organizations. And uh, we're looking to have Institute Security as a collaboration partner, but I think even most hospitals, um, even if they get their act together in terms of politically arranging the professors and the groupies and then also the board to have a clear strategy and execute on it, then there's still the question of budget. I mean, the um, hospitals and universities are not very well budgeted when it comes to kind of IT and doing new projects. It's often just, okay, let's do the basics, let's make sure that sort of it, and doing something 
like this requires efficient investment. So as you can see, they created the cheap data office that we're working with, right? It's a whole new reason that we actually can do this. Otherwise, if I go to the, um, the board of directors of a random European UMC and I tell them, you should do fair data, and then say, great, yeah, that's a good idea, and then say, okay, um, I would recommend you make a 70 million program to actually do this, then they look at me like, oh, I'm not sure what you're talking about. So this is the problem. There's the reality out there, which is currently happening in the organization, and then you're making a model. Now you have to schematize it somehow. Is, is that what your question yeah, is about? What, what, what is the substance about the version of the organization that allows you to assume a model of work? How, how do you think it should be implemented in the um, Yeah, it's a good question. I think that depends very much on um, what you're trying to do with your So let's say um, in, in the example that I gave from Yves Curie, there is this desire to link the hospital complex to the research complex, right? So then the assumption about the organization is that research projects, or, or so research groups, some of them at least, are using, in some cases, samples which come from the hospital. Based on that assumption, you can now start to model, okay, so we have uh, samples registered in the uh, hospital information system. I have research group reusing that. Let's go through a consent process, etc. And that's how you come to this model. Yeah, so I think you have like a very interesting business model working with open source. I was wondering if you actively work with the core developers of this project or for example, you have the case where you just like fork out from the original source code and you just like create your own custom and version, mm -hmm. custom hype version that fits the use of the network. You mean if there's a risk of other companies doing that or? No, like, like if, you, if you work with the people that are working in the open source project, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 I see your point now. So the open source projects that we work with, our primary directive is always to do something which is useful for the community as a whole, not just one customer that we happen to have. So what we always will attempt is looking at, okay, you are asking us to develop an extension or a new functionality. How can we bring this back to the open source community so that everyone can now use it? And it's important that we do this mechanism because if you don't keep doing that, then there is really the whole idea of the open source community and the value you get from it sort of goes away. Of course, it doesn't always in every instance happen, but I would say for the vast majority of the uh, certainly new uh, function developers and 
in software development, we are able to share that with the community. We also write that in the master services agreements that we have with pharma companies. That is not an easy thing to get to the legal, but we do it because um, we believe in it, and often the customers that we work with also believe in it. So they really want to make this open source uh, function and happen. Uh, also, there is quite a big exception to this, which is data. So any any time we do a project which is data curation or even data modeling, sometimes can be IP protected. So we typically, if we curate the data set from a pharma company, we're obviously not going to publish that as open data. That would be in violation of the rules and also make no, no sense. Yeah, 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 and it's a very good question, and actually this may not be a good example in that respect. So we set Fairspace as just one tool that helps you to organize data that's already there and to create models fast. I think there is a whole ecosystem of fair tools that we need, including, for example, the institutional repository, but also integrations um, between uh, open databases. So let's say there was the data mats prototype, which came from the BioCaddy project. You know. BioCaddy. So, so this BioCaddy project was designed to, I guess, integrate multiple different biomedical sources and create one interface uh, to search it. And I think this works as long as we're using RDF and standards. Um, you can federate information from data catalogs to each other. So I, this example is I have my own Fairspace workspace, which is kind of at the lowest level. I federate it to the institutional repository. Now from the institutional repository, I can publish it in an open science repository. And similarly, I mean this BioCaddy data match prototype, I think nicely shows that it is actually possible to create a search index of biomedical research. And that is the way forward. I'm convinced of this. It's just, we need a lot of things in place, including this bottleneck of data stewards. I mean that fair, uh, GoFair estimated we need to train 500 thousand data stewards or something. I think that was a bit maybe overestimating, but it's clear that if we want this to happen, we need to a shift towards uh, being more aware of data and not just seeing data as something I do in the course of my projects and then throw away. Right, yeah, no, I, it's not so much yeah, the infrastructure I think is very scalable since this is all built on Kubernetes. Uh, so if you want to know about the infrastructure, so here we have um, Kubernetes is on the basis and then we have a number of uh, microservices like this API gateway here and then we have Keycloak for the authentication. We have Apache Jenna. So typically there will be many Apache Jenna instances because every workspace has their own. That's also because it's hard to scale triple store beyond a certain extent. Um, then you have the metadata and vocabulary, which are linked to um, Jenna, and this is sort of the governance layer. Oh yeah, and I forgot to say, but the searching is actually powered by an Elasticsearch index. Yeah, that's the standard question uh, people ask when they see that number in that paper. So from a European Commission perspective, I guess you look, you're looking at Europe as an economy, economic whole somehow. Um, this is a one-time investment in infrastructure which will both help uh, researchers, so R&D in general, to become more competitive, 
And so supposedly the rewards are going to be much higher than the costs because um, so in the paper they look into, okay, how, how, how often is data stored? The same data is stored multiple times because it's just not findable. It's kind of an easy example, but yeah, it's true. Um, apparently on average data sets are stored three point something times. And yeah, we could reduce further. But a more interesting one, of course, is the um, non harder to quantify um, the, the, the results that I get from having better data, it enables me to do science better or research and development in, in a more effective way. And that is a very hard one to quantify. The other thing is that if you look at a company like Google or Amazon, they're from the ground up based on a data-driven strategy, which means they consider data very the asset. And if you would define Novartis or Roche today, for sure you would make it very different. You would make it much more data-driven in terms of how the company works. Unfortunately, it's not feasible to just do that, right? You can't just reimagine a company even though the CEO is part of that, that, that's what they're doing, but that's a gradual process. Thank you.